Thank you for joining me for our Good Friday meditation. We're going to begin right now with hymn number 425, Go to Dark Gethsemane. Go to dark Gethsemane, all who feel the tempter's power, your Redeemer's conflict see, watch with him one bitter hour, turn not from his griefs away, learn of Jesus Christ to pray. Follow to the judgment hall, view the Lord of life arraigned, O oh, the wormwood and the gall, O oh, the pangs his soul sustained, shun not suffering, pain, or loss, learn of him to bear the cross. Calvary's mournful mountain climb, there adoring at his feet, mark that miracle of time, God's own sacrifice complete. It is finished, hear him cry. Learn from Jesus Christ to die. Early hasten to the tomb where they laid his breathless clay. All is solitude and gloom. Who has taken him away? Christ is risen, he meets our eyes. Savior, teach us so to rise. On this solemn occasion, as we remember the death of our Lord and Savior, we worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Your sins have been forgiven because of Jesus. Amen. Scripture reading today is from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 to 7 and the second half of verse 12. Isaiah's prophecy of Good Friday. Surely Jesus took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. He was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession 
for the transgressors. We'll sing hymn number 405, On My Heart Imprint Your Image. On my heart imprint your image, Blessed Jesus, King of grace, That life's riches, cares, and pleasures Have no power to hide your face. Let the clear inscription be, Jesus crucified for me. Is my life my hope's foundation, and my glory and salvation. The Word of God we want to consider for this Good Friday meditation is from Matthew chapter 27, verses 38 to 54. Two robbers were crucified with Jesus, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tomb, tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Let's bow our heads for prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Lord, our strength and our salvation. Amen. My dear fellow believers in Jesus, imagine that you were standing there at Calvary on Good Friday, the first Good Friday. There'd be an awful lot to take in the different sights and the smells that were there probably, but, but right now as we're looking at this, I want you to focus on the, the sounds. What do you hear if you were there at that first Good Friday? There's a cacophony of voices that you would hear all around you. And as we continue to look at at our Lenten series, God on Trial, we see that those voices really do say that God was on trial through all of those voices, through everything that was happening there on that Good Friday. God was on trial. Was this Jesus really the Son of God, really the Savior of the world? And let's consider the voices that doubt Jesus, and then let's also consider the love 
of the Savior. And that love of the Savior, really, that's the evidence that we need. The first voice that you notice maybe is that of the Jewish religious leaders. They seem to have the most to say. They said he saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. You know, at this point in time, as far as the Jewish religious leaders were concerned, well, the trial was over. The sentence was being carried out. They did just what they wanted to do. And now they're still sarcastically speaking, demanding that he, that he provide evidence for his claim that he was the Son of God. The next voice that you maybe hear is that of the soldiers who are beneath the cross. Luke's gospel tells us that they join in, also saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourselves. And evidently, those soldiers who had been making sport of Jesus, having their sadistic fun against him, they wanted to continue having their fun at Jesus' expense. And you can notice there are voices from the road, those people who were passing by the crucifixion. And, and now those people passing by, they're chiming in because they're hearing all of those people who are looking to Jesus saying, I'll prove who you are. Well, they chime in. You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down now from the cross if you are the Son of God. And, well, what moves somebody who's just passing by to, to shout at a dying man like that and to further heap insults on him? And finally, if you're there at Calvary, you pick up the two voices that are above you next to the Savior, you look up and you see those two men who are being crucified with Jesus, who are, who are saying the same thing. Again, Luke provides us the details, what they said. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. And now in those words, do you detect some desperation from those two thieves? Some desperation? Are they hoping that maybe there's something really to the charges that were made against Jesus and maybe this just might be their lucky day that Jesus would have the power to save himself and, and save them as well? The voices, the voices you're hearing, they're putting God on trial and they're from different people in different tones from different places on that hill, but they all have that one diabolical chorus with a clear theme saying, prove it, if you are the Son of God, show me, show us. And still today, there are voices like that that ring out against God and, and against his people, putting God and, and his people on trial? Maybe the questions are, if there is a God, where's the proof? Why can science explain everything, supposedly, without him? And why is there so much evil in the world if there is a God? Why do so many prayers go unanswered? And if you are God, make me better when I'm sick. Give me a sign, then I'll believe. You know, those statements we hear from people all around, putting God, putting Jesus on trial to say that God really isn't God or that Jesus isn't really the Savior. Just like those at Calvary, Calvary these voices, they come from different places, and some are spoken in hatred by people who are determined to fight against a God that they can't stand because of 
what he says for us in our lives? Oh, some are spoken, oh, with a singular goal of making fun of God and making fun of those who would believe in Jesus. And some maybe are speaking in the tone of skepticism that shakes its head at Christianity's claims. And, and some maybe are being proclaimed in a spirit of desperation too, as if the speaker would love to be wrong and maybe there would be some sort of an answer in Jesus. But the world today, the world to people today, they continue to put God on trial and demand to see evidence you hear the voices, and how do those voices affect you? Again, picture yourself there on Golgotha, on Calvary, listening, not as a fly-on-the-wall observer like the people we've mentioned, but you're a disciple of Jesus. How do those voices make you feel? Do they maybe make you feel angry, saying something like, how dare you say these things? Or maybe frustrated, you just don't understand who he is. Or maybe those voices might make you wonder a bit if those voices really are right, challenging God, challenging Jesus. Questions maybe that come to your mind. Why isn't God doing anything? I've seen him multiply loads, heal the blind, raise the dead. Why won't he come down from the cross? Is this the limit of his power? Is he not the one I thought he was? That's what the disciples could have been saying back then, and that's what we can say as we have our questions about Jesus. Likewise, all the, the calls for proof from around us today, that affects us here today. We'll ask questions like, well, if Jesus is the Son of God, why did he let this ha tragedy happen to me in my life? Why doesn't he stop his enemies from taking advantage of his people and mocking his name? Why doesn't he give some kind of proof, some kind of sign? Why does he stay quiet? From our own sinful hearts, our voices join in the chorus and, and Satan, he hears us saying that and, and he just smiles because he's going after us and, and he's tempting us and maybe getting us to falter. The solution though isn't to ignore those voices that are raised against Jesus. In fact, if we listen more closely, we'll notice that those first voices really were on to something. They said, he saved others. If only they had set aside their spite for a moment, they might have followed up with the right question then. He saved others. Why doesn't he save himself? They didn't consider the fact that Jesus was refraining from using his power, saving himself for a reason? Why didn't the man, the God-man, who could raise the dead, who did raise the dead, why didn't he save his own life? For all of our questions, Jesus did have one question as well, and his question is meant to be an answer. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Son of God calls out not to his Father, but to his God. And it's not a cry of unbelief, but it's a cry of absolute agony. It reveals what no one standing there could really see. The man on the middle cross, he wasn't just suffering from that crown of thorns that was punched into his head or the, the beating that had ripped up his back or 
the nails in his hands and feet and, and whatever ways they were mocking him, that wasn't his real suffering and, and, and all the ridicule that he was enduring. The man who had done nothing wrong in the court of humankind and nothing wrong in the court of God, he was suffering God's wrath for the sins of others. Not sins of his own, he was sinless. He is sinless. His question came from the depths of the torment that I deserved, that you deserved. The one who saved others didn't save himself. Why? Because he loves us. That's the answer to all of the why questions. Why doesn't God do the things that we think he should do? Why doesn't Jesus do this? Or why would he allow this to happen in our world? If our Savior was willing to suffer and die in our place, we cannot doubt his love. And would he be abandoned by God and then end up abandoning us? Of course not. Would he meticulously follow every command of God, fulfill every prophecy in scripture, and forgive every sin only to make a mistake in our lives? Do something that was not what was right for us? The answer remains the same to our questions, remains the same. It must be because he loves us. It may not be the answer that we want, but it is definitely the answer that we need. God always is acting. Jesus always is acting in our lives on the basis of his love. We often put God on trial. We tend to doubt and to question him but his love for us is always at work. The cross proves it. Everything he went through proves for us that, well, for us as believers anyway, it says you want to trust in him because he's always looking out for you with his love. Well, not everyone on that hill was blind to this. Matthew tells us about those two thieves that well, they joined the chorus, but then Luke says one changed his mind. One changed his mind. And what moved that thief to be torn away from the other mockers? What moved him to turn from mocking Jesus to defending him and looking to him and praying to him? It, it wasn't any display of power, Jesus looked weak and looked defeated there. Rather, it was Jesus' humble love. Maybe it was his prayer for forgiveness for those who were crucifying him, or his dignity in the face of his mocking, or perhaps other words that Jesus may have spoken there at the cross that aren't recorded for us. Whatever it was, we can say that the Holy Spirit was definitely working that day and was working on that one thief's heart so that he looked in faith to Jesus and Jesus promised him that today, that day, they would be together in paradise. And now Jesus still works in us the same way. By a simple washing, he puts his spirit on us to convince us that he's our savior. I'm talking about baptism here. And through time-worn words, through the scriptures, the gospel, he speaks to us of that same forgiveness, the same promise of paradise. And in an unassuming meal, the Lord's Supper, he lets us touch and taste, exhibit A, his the, the real evidence there, his very body and blood that he gave for us. And these means, they bring Jesus' death to us to forgive our doubts and to put them to rest about who Jesus really is. Of course, of course, the skeptics in our world 
And in our own hearts, we'll say, maybe God doesn't help me because he can't. Or maybe there, is, there are no signs from God because there is no God. Sounds a lot like those voices that were there at the cross. God has another answer for all of those doubters. At the moment that Jesus died, what happened is that the temple curtain was torn in two, and the earth shook, the rocks split, the tombs broke open, and the dead came to life. And all of those things that were happening together, that was enough for the centurion there at the cross and some soldiers who were there to, as well to acknowledge that Jesus must have been the Son of God. The centurion, those soldiers, they said, surely he was the Son of God. And as you know, that was all just a preview. The clinching, more evidence would come on Sunday, on Easter Sunday. But this display of power, but this display of power removes any last doubt that Jesus couldn't be the Son of God. There were the eyewitnesses, friends and foes alike, who saw it and testified to the fact that Christ was risen. Their accounts are recorded and and with the Holy Spirit's stamp of approval, they're preserved for us to see the evidence, the proof of the resurrection. There's no question that the one who was put on trial, who went through everything that Jesus went through, the suffering and the dying, there's no question that that is our God. That is our Savior. That is God on trial. The evidence clearly tells us God on trial. Therefore, there's no question that this Jesus, he's our Savior. Today, he gives us proof of that amid the chorus of those doubters demanding evidence. The silent suffering of the Son of God Really, that's all the evidence that we need. His refusal to save himself is proof of his determination to save us and of his amazing love for us. He cries out to God in, in such agony, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To prove that what he was doing is he was suffering every bit of punishment that you and I deserved that the world deserved because of our sins. And his confident trust when he gives his spirit, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, that gives us the proof, the evidence that his work was done. And, well, the Father, he shakes the world to confirm it, tearing that curtain temple, shaking the world, the earthquake, the tombs being broken open. On, Gol on Golgotha, what Jesus did, does is he gives us all the evidence that we need. Our sins, they're forgiven. Heaven is our home because of Jesus. Amen. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. Let's confess our faith with the second article and its meaning. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from death and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. Let's pray. God most holy, look with mercy on this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, be given over into the hands of the wicked, and suffer death on the cross. Keep us always faithful to him, our only Savior. We pray in the name of him who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, in our prayers we we think of Tony Alfaro was called to his eternal home on Wednesday morning. We are so thankful for the grace and mercy you gave to him, making him one of your believing children and, and taking him home to heaven. Be able to celebrate Easter with you. What a blessing for him. Please comfort his loved ones with that hope of a blessed reunion in heaven through faith in Jesus our Savior. Please also look after all of the people in our church family who are de dealing with different aches and pains and problems. Look out for those who are close to us that we wish would know about the Savior who wouldn't have the doubts or rejection of Jesus but would look at the evidence and see that Jesus lived and died for them and paid for their sins and, and through faith in them, through faith in Jesus, there's that certainty of heaven. Give us all that certainty so that the questions, they do affect us, but that we'd always be able to look to Jesus and, Jesus and know he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we gather up all of the prayers we have right now as we join in praying. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Thank you for joining me for our Good Friday worship. Reminder, Easter Sunday, our regular service schedule with uh, Easter brunch in between services, Easter egg hunt for the, for the kids, about 9.45 a.m. Hope to see you on Easter, and, and here it is. It's the day we think about Christ's suffering and death for us, but isn't it great that we can, we can end the day saying, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, alleluia. The Lord bless and keep you always.